Android Assistant does this. So let's see if I can do as well as Jake does. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Denise Bedford, and we're uh, presenting another one of our KM at KSU webinars. Uh, we have two uh, very uh, prestigious guests today. Um, I'm going to introduce to you Michael Kubayanda, um, and Michael is going to introduce an interview, conduct a conversation with Marsha Van Olsen. So Michael Kubayanda is an analyst in the Risk Analysis Research Center in the Postal Services Office of the Inspector General. He serves as the Communications Futures Team there. He develops insights and solutions on regulation, e-commerce, and delivery networks, privacy, and innovation. Prior to joining the OIG, Michael served as counsel for the Oversight and Government Reform Committee in the House of Representatives. He has degrees from Ohio State and Northwestern and is currently pursuing a graduate degree in the Communications, Culture, and Technology program at Georgetown. He is a certified information privacy professional. Any opinions Michael shares in this webinar are his own. Okay, so Michael, I'm going to turn um, the floor over to you. And Marshall, I'm going to give the presentation capability to you. All right. Okay. All right, Marshall, you you can go ahead and feel free to then show your desktop and your slides. Let's see. I find the share my desktop button. And can you see anything? We can see that. Fabulous. Yep. Right. If you just want to, yep. We'll try that. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. And I'll, I'll be mod, I'll be muting everyone. Great. So uh, let me. I'll do a very brief um, introduction. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Marshall Van Alstein. Um, who is a, a professor at uh, Boston University and um, also a scholar at MIT. Um, professor Van Alstein is an expert on information economics and really one of the leading experts in the world on this topic and has done Hello? information markets. Hello? That was, that was my fault. moment. My fault. You're okay. fine. Okay. And so uh, Professor Van Alstein has done really interesting work on um, information markets, um, the nature of information goods, um, uh, platform economics, and two-sided markets. Um, and a, a particular applicability here um, for this webinar is um, work he's done on uh, workplace productivity and uh, internal knowledge markets. And he was uh, kind enough to share um, his article from the uh, MIT Sloan Management Review on internal knowledge um, markets, and uh, so I think this this work has uh, special applicability uh, here today. So uh, uh, I should mention also that Professor Van Alstein um, has a BA from Yale and uh, master's and PhD degrees from MIT um, in information sciences. So with that, I'll uh, go ahead and pass it over to Marshall. Well, Michael, thank you very much. Um, well, happy to present some of this work, but let me also uh, try to make it interactive. So, uh, Michael, do feel free to jump in with any questions, or if anyone in the audience wants to jump in with a question or uh, key in uh, a chat box to Michael, we can try to discuss it and, and take the uh, conversation a couple of different directions. I also do want to acknowledge my colleagues on the research, uh, Dr. Benvia uh, in France, Dawei Shen, who's a PhD student of mine, at, uh, just finished up at the Media Lab and has actually built some of the tools I'll be describing. Uh, Marco DiMaggio, who's a colleague in like, the economics department, uh, has tested some of these results in uh, banks to see if they actually work. And if you're interested in the following, you can try to reach me at the contact information below, you know, InfoEcon on Twitter or Marshall just at MIT at EDU, and delighted to hear from any of you. Well, give me, let me give you a little bit of background on the kinds of things that I do in information economics. One of these things is to look at information products and platforms. So you might look at, for example, how it is that the Android ecosystem competes with the Apple ecosystem or with Amazon or with, um, with Google. What are the product design questions? How do you price and package information? How do you create platform ecosystems is one of the things that, uh, that we focus on. Another is communications marketplaces. How is it you can get people to share information? How does that diffuse through organizations 
over time. Uh, can we create whole markets uh, inside organizations? The third category is information flows and productivity. Uh, we ran a five-year study for the National Science Foundation tracking all of the information flows inside several consulting firms and correlated that with the dollar measures of the consultant productivity to see what kinds of information behaviors and information seeking behaviors made those consultants more productive. And the last category is really the economics of information and intellectual property. What happens when you create property rights and information? Who should own it? Do you change the rates of innovation? Do you change the rates at which people contribute information? Do you create impediments to the distribution of information once it's created? How do you manage those kinds of questions? So it's really, it's a broad spectrum, but really all of it has to do with the economics of information, its value, its distribution, uh, and its creation. So really today, I'll be focusing on this one about information marketplaces. Can we cause information to be shared? Or in a knowledge management context, could we add some economics to social systems to actually optimize the distribution of information as a whole? So that's really what uh, I'm going to go into. If there's time, I can give you a little bit of the details on, on the third study on information and productivity, if there's some time at the end, and some of the findings we had and what it is that actually made people uh, productive based on the information that was shared. So let me start with a simple question. Where do good ideas come from? I don't know, does anyone want to try to volunteer any, or uh, I don't know how interactive we can try to make this. I know, Michael, do you have any thoughts, or do you want to pull some from the, from the audience? Uh, well, you know, we, we've actually been looking into this. Um, you know, I, I think from the, the staff level, is part of it is just um, – Going around and gathering ideas from your, you know, your engineers and your, um, your field staff um, is one of them. Sure, absolutely. Well, I would like to, I'd like to suggest that perhaps, um, actually, hold on. Uh, sorry, I put the, uh, I put the background here too first. I'm going to argue that good ideas can come from almost any place. Um, so, so, sorry, this was, in some sense, crowdsourcing. You ought to be able to get ideas from your staff, from outside your organization, from uh, folks above, all around, kind of 360 degree uh, innovation. So I really want to see if we can figure out where good ideas come from. It really could come from almost anywhere. So we really want to see if we can capture ideas broadly from lots of different places. So here's an example of a kind of knowledge management problem. We describe this in the in the Sloan article. Uh, uh, one of the world's largest engineering firms, ACOM, was uh, trying to produce biofuels down in Argentina. One byproduct of biofuels is sugar dust. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have, have background in farming or you know, uh, farm equipment or uh, grain in particular, but one of the problems around grain silos is that the dust, the flour dust, can actually burn quite far and maybe even be explosive. The, the uh, biofuels produce sugar dust which is even more explosive. You don't want explosions near your fuels processing. Uh, you have a big boom will really cause a lot of problems. The team tasked with solving that problem was based in London. They couldn't come up with an answer. Um, after a couple of months, they finally discovered an engineer in Australia who had a solution to help them solve the problem. It was really trying to connect the dots. They got lucky by uh, posting the problem to a bulletin board, and someone else pointed to it, and they found their engineer internally inside the organization, but in a remote location. Uh, and they weren't even aware that they had the expertise inside the organization. What we'd like to try to do is to kind of automate that process, to get resources connected, to match task to talent, uh, to see if we can actually solve that problem in a general way using kind of information more knowledge marketplaces. Here's a, this is kind of a problem for a really long time. If you look at, you know, 50 years worth of social software, um, you know, originally they were internal share drives, these were expanded into local area networks and wide area networks. Uh, these evolved into Lotus Notes and Microsoft Outlook. More recently, these have been developed into things like SharePoint, instant messaging, and social software. It's really come a long way. It's also quite a, kind of interesting, at the far left are the systems that have highly structured information. These tend to be uh, things like relational databases. And at the far right tend to be things like social software, wikis and blogs with highly unstructured information, sometimes making it harder to find what you need, even though you're capturing a great deal, where at the far left it's easier to find it, but you don't capture nearly so much. You really want to see if we can actually optimize all of those things and get get them uh, to improve over time and, and put some measures on them. Here is a 
McKinsey report that came out about a year ago suggesting that there were huge possible gains to social software. These are different systems, enterprise social software used to try to capture uh, information uh, and, and get folks to contribute. They talked about co-creation, you know, product design, deriving custom insights, and having customers contribute ideas, uh, providing customer care and interaction. Um, number 10 is one of my favorites, though, is, again, this question of how to match talent to task. That's really one of the things we're going to try to do to see if we can optimize and improve it. It is interesting, by the way, that the same report says these gains, that you could get these colossal gains, they argue maybe even as much as 20% if you can help save people save time finding the information they need. But the gains could be really hard to achieve. Um, you know, if you put these social systems into organizations, they may be using social technology to connect to the internet and watch YouTube or share pictures of cats. Uh, and that's not necessarily a great way to increase productivity uh, of your workforce inside organizations. So how do you how do you manage all of these things? Well, you actually get the best productivity and not just um, you know content and distraction. Uh, as another example, this is a slide from Booz Allen and Hamilton of um, International Finance Corporation. It's a really interesting question of where you find experts in the organization. The left-hand column shows the tenure organizations, uh, people inside organizations trying to um, get information, and the columns to the right represent the people they're going to. And as you can see, everyone's trying to go to people at the top. This is, you know, they try to get answers from people with 10 or more years of experience. And this has two problems. One, the people at the top become bottlenecks for information. They become, you know, the people, everyone's trying to go to them for help, and um, it's very hard to get, either it becomes a distraction to them or they may not have time to meet all the demand. The second thing is, in some ways, they underdevelop and underutilize mid tier talent. So it's perfectly likely you could get a good answer from someone to three to four years of experience, but people don't know where to find them. So, um, again, can we use social software? Can we use some optimization to help address these kinds of problems? And again, this isn't just, you know, kind of speculative research. This is actual findings of a consulting project in a major organization, in this case, International Finance Corporation. Um, information Week even featured some of the problems with social software a while back. Sometimes the difficulties are uh, there's inadequate incentives to share or participate. Uh, there's a beautiful description of sometimes these things have the effect of adding noise, kind of creating an informational ADD or attention deficit disorder. They chase down too many different things and start getting distracted. Uh, and that sometimes there's little managerial control, and almost none of these knowledge management systems can measure their return on investment. So these have all been pain points. We'd like to see if we can't use some economic tools to improve those um, those kinds of issues. So these are the, this is the space of things that we like to try to go into. So, and I'll only pause for a moment, Michael. See if there are any questions on that. And just what it is that we're trying to go after. Really trying to increase rates of knowledge sharing. Um, shape the community of knowledge sharing, give people credit for knowledge sharing, and even perhaps measure the actual value created by knowledge sharing. Okay. So any questions on that so far? Uh, none on this end. Okay. Well, so here's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to use several different economic tools to do this. We won't, there, there won't be any equations today, but we're going to try to use a couple of different ideas. One of them is to use kind of network economics, a two-sided market theory, in order to increase participation rates. Sometimes the participant rates can be a little bit low, so we'll see if we can use some network economics to boost the participation rates. We're going to try to use some price theory to value the information that people share. So can we actually measure and quantify what uh, folks have contributed to the system. We're then going to try to use the same theories that Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke used for the Federal Reserve to see if we can't shape a knowledge economy and grow a knowledge economy over time. And we're also going to use information economic theory, you know, adverse selection, signaling, and screening to see if we can find the good stuff among all the stuff that's shared. So can you motivate high quality contributions and can you identify that quality contribution. So those are those are the six sets of tools that we're going to try to use to make things happen. So to get started, um, I actually want to cover a couple of different you know, information marketplaces, just to give you some of the things that we're going to try to cover. So this is a chart that got cut for reasons of space from the Sloan Management Review article that we shared. 
Let me just point out a couple of different information sharing marketplaces. We're going to try to use these. One kind is a prediction market. Can you guess a likely outcome? So, for example, can you predict who's going to win an election? Can you predict a currency fluctuation? Can you predict whether a product will be successful? Could you predict who's getting an Academy Award? We can use these information aggregation mechanisms to see if we can't create crystal balls and get um, better results uh, in forecasting. The second are the kinds of question and answer marketplaces where you simply pose a question. You may have seen examples like Quora or information exchanges where you pose a question, other provide answer, and you may be able to increase the information flow of the organization and get people to solve problems quickly. There are innovation markets where you have a grand challenge or a problem and try to get the crowd to help you provide better answers. The flip side of that are idea markets where you think you have an answer and then you use the crowd to refine it. Every single one of these has a push side and a pull side or a demand side and a supply side. There are needs for ideas and there are sources of ideas. And all of these are just different instances of knowledge markets. Let me see if I can give you a couple of examples just for thought. So here, here we'll walk through a couple of them. So here's a prediction market. These have been faster and better than opinion polls in almost every case. And the opinion, these prediction markets have correctly forecast presidential election in each of the last five presidential elections. They also capture information really quickly. I'll give you an example. Uh, anyone, so here's that um, drop in the success or the likely prediction that Mitt Romney was going to win, and that was when uh, Mitt um, Romney lost to Newt Gingrich, uh, Georgia and uh, South Carolina, and it appeared that he was going to then sweep the South and possibly take over the election. Anyone want to guess what this particular uh, Let's see, there's this other drop over here, this big dip over here from Mitt Romney. Anyone want to guess, guess what that one was? I don't know, Michael or Denise, anyone else want to try? That was the 47% comment, um, you know, he said, where he said most folks were preloaded and that really hurt the polls. How about this particular spike for Obama back in May? There's a big spike up here. Uh, there was one, it was the flip side of the 47% comment, but then there was the Osama bin Laden uh, engagement. You can actually see these knowledge markets capture information really quickly. Um, here's just a fun one also. This was the prior presidential election with, um, uh, with McCain, the blue line being the Democrats and the red line being Republicans. You can see a spike up when Sarah Palin entered the race. The high uncertainty looked like it might actually be really interesting play. And then she said very, several very silly things, and there was a big spike down uh, as she then um, you know, spoke off of uh, venture on different policies. So you could see what happened with that. But again, it captures information uh, very quickly. Another interesting example, I don't know if any, many of you heard of this, Google flu trend. This uses decentralized information capture to identify where flu is outbreak. And what usually happens is that people, when they start to feel ill, will key in search terms on the symptom. Uh, this gives Google about a 10-day advantage over the Center for Disease Control. So that, you know, the, center, the CDC uses actual doctor's reports of when people have shown up sick versus when people just do the Google search. So it gives, again, about a 10-day lead time in the prediction of when there's an actual flu outbreak. Do notice there's a difference between um, correlation versus causation. When the first news story broke on this, all of a sudden a whole bunch of folks tried it out, so it looked like there was this massive flu outbreak, when in fact it was just the press event. So do, do distinguish between correlation and causation in these. Here's a good example of another question and answer knowledge market. This is Sermo, which is a place for doctors to query other doctors anywhere in the world to get medical advice. So they could be looking for um, you know, a particular treatment, or maybe they hadn't seen a particular condition associated with a particular disease, or maybe they're looking for drug interaction effects. The beauty is that you can query a doctor on this broad forum, and you must be a registered nurse or medical practitioner in order to be on the site. Uh, but it's away from the share information. It was originally set up by a doctor frustrated when Merck was covering up the fact that Viax was causing heart attacks. And he thought that if doctors could share information, they could pick up these trends more quickly and actually then solve much broader social problems. In a sense, it is a wonderful um, innovation marketplace, which is a spin-off of Eli Lilly. When they had 
uh, pharmaceutical challenges that they couldn't solve. They opened it up to solvers across the globe, offering large amounts of prize money for better solutions. This was so effective that they spun it off into this other organization, Innocentive. Prizes range from 5000 to a million dollars, uh, and it's become quite effective at solving problems that organizations themselves could not solve. Um, it's interesting also that a majority of the solutions are actually reused information. Uh, research by Krim Lakani suggested that 72 and a half percent, uh, whereas only uh, about a quarter, 27 and a half percent, is completely novel uh, invention. The other is just reapplication of existing knowledge, but it's in a new domain, not recognized by the person posing the question. Uh, decision markets are used at Hewlett Packard, Bank of America, Google. It's interesting that a number of these things happen. Uh, Bank of America, in some ways, has better forecasts of the U.S. economy than the U.S. government. The U.S. government uses tax receipts to figure out what's happening, but the Bank of America can actually use credit cards so it has direct observations of the transactions that are taking place. Um, similarly, HP was using these forecasting systems and by crowdsourcing them, was able to predict the success of sales in particular divisions better than the managers of those divisions. It was a really interesting way of and getting better forecasts of where things are headed. Um, a really good example was also the Princeton idea market. This was student government trying to figure out how to send, spend its budget. The elected student officials put together their favorite ideas on how to spend the, um, spend the student resources. Then they opened it to student vote, but they also allowed students to contribute new ideas. The really cool result was at the end of the voting, Three of the top five ideas were not anticipated by the elected student officials. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it was seven of the top ten were not anticipated by the elected representatives. It's a really interesting uh, illustration of two points. First, by increasing the number of participants, you increase the variety of ideas that are submitted. But the second point is that you can then sort them in order of priority to the organization. We're going to make use of that idea in a number of different ways later. But really, the crowdsourcing has this property of increasing variety and then increasing the sort order to help you identify the really good material. And that's what we're really going to try to do. Now the question is, how do we do this inside organizations? So we've used market concepts, we've used economic concepts to see what's happening outside organizations. Can we bring these inside organizations? So can we bring in trade and incentive inside the organization, or Sermo and eBay inside the organization, experts exchange and clout inside the organization. So we're going to see if we can use some of these economic-driven knowledge marketplaces inside organizations as well to improve knowledge sharing. One good example, as a starting baseline, comes from McKinsey. This is an old slide from them, it's from 2008, where they actually believe, conceive of a knowledge market with a demand side and a supply side. And this is a, they're, they're very gracious to share it. This is their slide, not mine. The demand side are the people that are looking for uh, solutions, and the supply side uh, are people who have expertise. You can imagine if this works, they could dramatically increase their productivity. So, for example, that expertise uh, that they sold to Citibank uh, last year, they might sell to Bank of America this year, increasing the productivity of the consultant workforce. But in the middle is a platform that helps to match the experts to the people who need assistance or consultants who need a particular solution. Um, so the internal system uh, is a set of professionals as well as tools, documents, and repositories uh, helping to connect folks. Uh, they even have a very supportive culture where if you pose a question or try to reach a particular individual, they're supposed to get back to you within one business day uh, in order that they can actually get answers quickly. They have more than 30,000 documents. They claim that everyone in the organization uses it at least once a month. They also claim that 90% um, uh, of the content is reused at least once a year. Again, we, we think dramatically boosting productivity. I can actually show you some data on that uh, later uh, in the discussion. One of the things that we're going to be doing, again, is using some of these platform ideas. IT departments in the past, really, take a look at a platform like Microsoft Windows. Microsoft manages, it owns Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. 
If you take these ideas of, a, of long tail, you take all the applications developed on the Windows platform, Microsoft just controls the stuff at the top of the distribution, and the ecosystem creates stuff at the end of the distribution. The same thing's true of knowledge management. If you think of traditional knowledge management, it's usually been run by the IT department. And they might take the stuff that's codified, the expertise that are the documents that are written up, and they become responsible for that. But what about the questions for which haven't previously been answered. The IT department shouldn't provide that. You want to use the ecosystem to provide that in the same way that Microsoft's ecosystem helps it create new value. In the same way that the Apple um, iPhone ecosystem has offered now more than 800,000 apps. When, my, when Apple provides what, a dozen, maybe two dozen? This ecosystem creates enormous value. You can actually tap the expertise of a large number of other users. That's what you want to do. One of these ideas, so again, you want to use other people to provide information expertise out on the long tail uh, for the non-codified or the rare or the novel uh, problems that arise. This, in some ways, you can view it as a platform. This ties back into the research on platform economics. You have demand and supply side that become reciprocally valuable. The more experts you have on a platform, the more useful it becomes to users. The more users you have on the platform, the more the experts add value to the organization as a whole. You have these very positive feedbacks. We can use many of the same platform concepts to see if we can't grow these ecosystems using some of these network effects. Um, we're going to use incentives to do this. It's kind of fun. This is a quote from NTT Software, a Japanese company, that had this marvelous observation that attempts to promote knowledge management requiring employees to share have failed, uh, and I'm going to suggest that they're really good at it, and if the Japanese can't get folks to share information, then probably no one can. Um, it's interesting that a year and a half after introducing one of these knowledge management systems uh, to promote knowledge, a knowledge marketplace, to promote sharing, uh, the employees are providing better service, best practices spread from engineering to sales, and redundant work, that reuse, improved dramatically. Redundant work fell by 9,000 hours within the organization. So how are we going to measure and stimulate value? We're going to try to do a couple of different things to do that. So let's see, what are we going to do to create these knowledge marketplaces? We're going to harness incentives and some of the economics of pricing. First. We're going to use both of these different tools. <clears throat> so we're going to try to capture as broad an array of human motivation as possible. We're going to try to make it fun. We're going to try to give fun, fame, and fortune. We're trying to give some recognition, and we'll give some rewards. we will actually see if we can't compensate folks for the value they create for the organization as a whole. So let's start with um, my favorite example is a question and answer exchange that developed internally at the large enterprise software company, SAP. So SAP produces the most successful enterprise software in the world. Um, when they had engineering challenges, they needed to help, they wanted the developers to help one another. So again, it's not the IT department providing centralized service, it's the entire developer community within SAP helping the developer community. They set up an ecosystem where uh, if you asked a question, the best answer could earn 10 points, then two second best answers could earn six points, and then as many questions as uh, answers as um, were out there could earn two points. <clears throat> you, white papers might get up to 25 points, wiki posts or blog posts could earn up to 120 points for really, really valuable content. Um, I don't know if you can see it over on the right, but there's a listing. You can sort individuals by their points, earnings, and their reputation effects. You can look for individuals based on their proven expertise in answering questions on COBOL programming in North Dakota uh, last month. So it's all time-bounded, it's expertise um, categorized, uh, and it's localized. So it's very easy, very straightforward uh, for folks. Um, that's, that's not a good time. Hold on, oh, okay. get, no uh, problem. Interrupting. Sorry. Um, sorry, we're getting an interruption uh, from the side. Um, this has created enormous value for SAP in a number of different dimensions. One, it's great providing motivation and recognition. The developers themselves have loved it. Uh, it's been so successful that they have opened it to developers outside SAP, and anyone in the SAP community can now participate. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to go on and sign up now, uh, any of you could go sign up for, uh, for their community. Uh, this, get, this saves them six to eight million tech support that they themselves don't have to supply because the community is, is providing it. 
uh, SAP promised one business day turnaround, but the average on the Q&A community exchange is 30 minutes, so you get help in really rapid time. Um, it's also caused information sharing. Previously, members of the sales team who might have been competing with one another or independent service providers, ISPs, that might have been competing with another, had no reason at all to help one another. In fact, they'd hoard their information. In this context, the incentives have completely changed. Now, uh, the employees at IS, um, uh, ISPs are now answering the questions of other ISPs to prove that they have the expertise and not the competitors. The beauty is that this, the information is now being made available to everyone in the ecosystem in a way that statistically can be shown to have increased the productivity of the entire ecosystem. Uh, this has created immense wealth for SAP as well as each of the uh, participants in it as a whole. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to allow, I'm gonna approve the ability to annotate. So, uh, um, so Michael, so I'm just granting you the ability to annotate. I hope you can All see right. that. All right, thanks, thanks, Marshall. That was actually an accident, but uh, I will annotate if necessary. Thank you. All right. No, it looked like someone was asking for that. So, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll pass that in. Um, anyway, so. Uh, it has now caused levels of information sharing in ways that have dramatically increased productivity of the ecosystem. Um, these are there are other examples of the same kind of thing. There is a uh, knowledge sharing system question and answer coil in Korea called knowledge, you know, knowledge in or kin. It's so popular that 80 percent of the population of Korea has registered. Um, it has continued to thwart Google in terms of its advance in uh, in Korea. And it's kind of fun. They've used these point systems to uh, create uh, reward systems that are really very interesting. I don't know if you can see it because the fonts are a little bit small, but in the top, um, on the bottom right, you can actually see the number of answers in different categories rises with the point values that you offer. Uh, and questions can be in categories of web design, stocks, law, finance, medicine, programming. It can even be on baby names and uh, car repair. Um, the levels of expertise go from peasant when you sign up all the way to expert and hero and eventually the sun, wind, and moon god uh, as you, you know, uh, you know, move higher and higher within the ecosystem. Uh, if you look on the left, they even use points to cause higher levels of information spillover. So if you give the best answer, you're an extra point. Uh, if you do extra voting in there, that creates value for other people, you can earn points. Um, also, if you are trashing the system or spamming it and putting in link garbage, you can lose points. So the points are being used to lubricate good answers and also penalize misbehavior. It's a really neat system for uh, managing the behavior uh, overall. So uh, these point systems actually do a number of really interesting things, uh, including motivating the contribution of content. Uh, most importantly, they also become transferable. Uh, you can actually, in, in the good systems, you can actually then spend the point. You can actually do something with them as opposed to simply giving a thumbs up or thumbs down. You can accumulate them over time and you can actually, um, you know, start to divert attention. It's a big difference in a system if you earn, you know, is it a five point question or is it a 5,000 point question? Is this because you misplaced a semicolon in your code or because you're about to land a million dollar contract and you really need some help? You can use the point to pre-signal that you've got a really urgent, important problem, and you may be able to divert the attention of a really senior executive at a point in time when you really need it. Go back to that bottlenecking question at International Finance Corporation. When should you divert the time of a senior most executive? Probably when it's a really important problem. But you shouldn't be diverting, diverting your attention on an unimportant problem. It, should, it would be the organization is better off if they're focusing on their own task as opposed to uh, focusing on someone else's task, but you really need to find the balance between when is their own work more important and when is this new opportunity or this serious sudden problem uh, worthy of attention. And these systems are really good as a way of actually solving that kind of problem. Um, other solutions to this have existed in other ways. I want to show you why the markets are so important. Hewlett Packard at one point was offering frequent flyer miles for, in, for using uh, Lotus Notes and providing questions and answers. Siemens was even offering actual shares of stock for doing it. It's interesting, though, that these are fixed prices. They weren't actually using economics. We know from 
classic economics, there's some interesting problems with this. If you set the price too low, you get under provision of information. If you set the price too high, you get oversupply. People will put up garbage just to get the shares of stock or just to get the frequent flyer points. It's not as though there's actual valid, valuable information there at all. As in any successful system, you need the value to float depending on the context. Is it urgent? Is it important? Has there just been an acquisition? Has there been an earthquake in Japan? Is there, um, you know, is there civil war? Is there a new stock acquisition? All of these markets need to have floating values. That's where you get efficient balance of supply and demand moving around properly. Right? Um, an interesting issue with SAP system is that points are capped at 10 points. So it really doesn't matter if it's a 10 point question or if again, it's a million dollar question. In an SAP question system, again, what I call it a stepping stone, you can't actually spend the points. The user's points simply expire. They become worthless after six months. So we're proposing that within the better marketplaces, you simply offer some transactions where people can turn around and spend them. As an example, uh, organizations are allowing you to do things like um, get free parking, or you could get lunch uh, with a senior executive, or in a smaller case, you could actually turn your points and get an iTunes gift card. The moment you can do this is the moment you can actually translate between virtual points and real dollars. You can calculate an exchange rate between what has been funny money and now what is all of a sudden an economic source of value. You can have real metrics in which you can now calculate what is the value of the information created in your ecosystem. All of a sudden, this is the first time you can put an ROI on your social software, and you might even be able to optimize it or accrue business value. What we're doing is using effectively the, the market series of Friedrich von Hayek. It's why it is that market economies do better than centrally planned economies with fixed prices. You're basically allowing the ecosystem to evolve and put the proper values on resources, particularly such things as knowledge, uh, over time. Um, so this, he even got the Nobel Prize for that. It was kind of fun, uh, just as a side note. Friedrich von Hayek lived just long enough uh, to see his theories carry out and see the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And then um, so he collected the Nobel Prize, w uh, watched the Soviet Union dissolve, and then checked out. He died a very happy man. Uh, in effect, knowledge markets are just in a realization of a movement from more centrally planned systems to decentralized systems where you can get um, uh, greater sources of expertise. You effectively move from central planning to uh, matchmaking. You've moved from top-down design to peer-to-peer -peer design. You've moved from elicitation of in expertise simply from the IT department and experts to elicitation and validation by peers. And rather than having fixed or no values on anything, you've allowed it to move around as you would with uh, a market economy. You're actually getting much, much, much better resource planning. Now, is there a way to grow your knowledge economy? Is there a way to actually improve it over time? There actually is. Look at another couple of the ways you might actually be able to do this. One of the things is that markets are really good at innovation. You've got Silicon Valley, you've got firms constantly trying to find new products to meet new demand. What we'd like to do is have systems adapt to the needs of users. How can we do that? Here's a really simple example. We're going to try to use the ideas of markets to create a property which we call design for self-design. We're trying to have the, the, the new features in the system designed by the users of the system. Imagine that you've left the help function out in your knowledge marketplace. What happens? In the question and answer marketplace, someone poses the questions. How do I do this? Someone then provides the answer, and boom, all of a sudden, that feature is now available to everyone else in the marketplace um, for anyone else to use forever. But it gets better than that. Suppose that you want to say, geez, I like this new chart, or I need this new software development, or I need a new kind of analysis. Someone can put that out there just as in the innovation exchange or just as in innovative, and someone else can build it to spec within the marketplace. You can actually create it. This takes advantage of exactly the ideas of that Princeton student government. 
someone, folks can actually put, uh, nominate features for development, and the community can decide which of these features for development should be implemented in priority order. The tool adapts to the needs of the users when that happens. Here's a simple example. Here's one, here's a system that was built at the MIT Media Lab, and you can see, for example, someone wanted to be able to post their questions via email. Someone else proposed, geez, I'd like to get a referral bonus. I don't have the expertise, but I happen to know that John has it. I'm going to connect you. Uh, can I get a bonus for that? These were nominated up, and these things could then get added to the system in the priority order that folks would like to see them. So the tools adapt to the needs of the users based on what the users themselves have told you that they'd like to see. Here's another way. Let me show you another, I'm going to jump forward to another uh, observation and then show you back to the theory. Here's something else. SAP, without realizing it, effectively tested a virtual fiscal policy. They said, I'll tell you what, we're introducing this new customer relationship management product, a new CRM product, but it's new. We really need you to, to figure out the features. We really want to boost development on that. So they said, for a period of two months, we're going to double the points on any questions, any answers, any white papers having to do with CRM. What happened? Well, the basic product started out at one level, but the community identified questions, they identified problems, they wrote the white papers, they answered the questions, and development in that area effectively doubled. It's just like running a fiscal campaign policy. It was actually expanding development. In this case, it basically cost them virtual points. What's happened is that we've really run, um, and we've basically created a federal reserve. We can run monetary and fiscal policies to grow an entire knowledge economy. You can, be, you basically have given executives the tools of a Ben Bernanke or a, um, you know, an Alan Greenspan. I'll show you examples of how we actually ran this in the tool of the Media Lab. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but <clears throat> the plots uh, actually show growth in the economy, the stimulus in the economy. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, this was a system being used by the students. You can actually see a spike here in the activity. We put an iPad on the marketplace in exchange for knowledge creation, and you can see this big spike in activity. Matter of fact, there was so much activity, people even tried to, we reinvented corruption in the knowledge marketplace. People started to cheat the system and tried to do money laundering in order to try to earn the iPad. Happily, uh, the markets are also self-correcting. The students started to wrap them out for actually having cheated, so it was really quite nice that it, uh, that it did that. But what's interesting is that you can actually dial down the incentive. You figured out that, it, that, was, um, that was, in some sense, almost too much of an incentive. On the right-hand side, uh, we actually dialed it back and we put several iTunes gift cards on the marketplace. So these were about $15 to $20 uh, gift cards as opposed to one $500 item. And it was actually much more effective. So we were able to stimulate the economy using several iTunes gift cards and folks earning points that they could then redeem to purchase uh, iTunes gift cards. That uh, was a, a fiscal stimulus. It was so successful that the dollar value of the information created wound up being about 1.9 times the dollar value of the stimulus package. So we could actually estimate the value creation relative to the value uh, used to stimulate the economy. Really, fairly nice uh, set of findings in there. Um, this is a new set of tools that we're actually developing at the Media Lab. Uh, sorry, at the, at the MIT Center for Digital Business. Um, these are tools to capture reuse. Let me pause for a moment and ask each of you uh, in the audience, how much value are you getting back from information, that you, the pictures that you post on Instagram or the blog posts that you post on Facebook? Uh, um, really, within any organization, how much? Um, about no time, people. I said, What's that? It's always been in there. I said, um, no, I said the course schedule. Is that, no, is, is that someone have a question? No, that was, I, I was trying to unmute everyone, but we got background noise. I'll watch for questions. This is to me. Okay. So one of the things we'd like to do is to reward people for having contributed ideas and having contributed content. What I've shown you here is a tree of documents derived from any do other documents. So when po people write proposals or develop papers or um, do work often, they base it, rather than starting from scratch, they base it on other work or, you know, in academia, it's quite common that when you develop a new course or you revise a course, you use existing curriculum materials or you borrow from colleagues um, or you revise last year's syllabus. 
You can create, in effect, a derivation tree, and you can start to create rewards for different parts of the organization. If you were to go back to McKinsey, for example, <clears throat> you could reward people for having created valuable content that other people created. You can actually do the, der the derivation. It's almost like adding a miniature intellectual property policy to the organization. And we're actually creating the tools to do that tracing. So if someone else reuses your idea, you can get credit for it, regardless of where it shows up, and even, even pieces of it are reused. So we think these have broad application, for example, um, in MOOCs, and online course development. If can faculty reuse other uh, content or students reuse other people's content, can you identify it? Um, can you actually reward the best sources of content? Uh, you have to be careful. In some cases, it's called plagiarism. In other cases, it's called course development. Uh, but in this case, the technology can be used to pick up on both of them. Um, what about patents and novelty? Is a patentable idea truly novel or is it uh, non-novel? You can actually look at the positions in the tree that's relationship to other ideas. Uh, what about contract development uh, or proposal writing? Uh, in the third category, you can actually then trace uh, sections of a contract that have been reused from other portions of the contract. Uh, or on the right, you can even look at, um, you know, credit different uh, DNA sequences to different labs for their discovery. All these are different examples of having found information that other people might reuse, uh, and you might be able to then give them credit uh, across some of these information marketplaces. Um, we, there was a, another bit of research that was done at the Center for Digital Business by uh, Wild Werner and McDonald that looked at organizational reuse of information, and they found that firms with above average reuse had 2.5, sorry, 2.1 percent higher revenue growth than firms uh, with below average reuse, which were two, which were minus 2.3, so a net of more than 4 percent between the top and the bottom. Um, and their margins, sorry, that was their net margin growth, and the revenue growth was a net difference of about 13 uh, percent, from plus 0.6 to minus uh, 6.7. So the amount of reuse in an organization is directly correlated with net margin and with revenue growth, and we think some of these tools could be used to cause more information sharing uh, and facilitate that information reuse, again, to cause higher rates of productivity. Um, here is just a collection of the design principles. Uh, these are articulated in the Slow Man Review article on launching knowledge marketplaces, developing and growing knowledge marketplaces, and evolving them over time. Uh, each of these principles are articulated in the um, uh, in the uh, article that we shared. Basically, you can think of this as taking social software, adding metrics, and then adding incentives to boost uh, and move the whole economy in one or another direction and see how you can actually move that uh, one way or another. Um, here is a uh, quick summary of the use of a knowledge market in a bank. Here, we correlated a question-answer exchange with the productivity of loan officers, and we found very strong statistical evidence that use of knowledge market is strongly associated with greater productivity. In fact, a 10% increase in use of knowledge market resulted in a 10% gain in productivity, which is roughly 25 days of uh, individual gain per year. Per person across the entire organization. It's huge. Um, and the plots over on the right show the distribution of productivity of the loan officers uh, of, across several different kinds of loans. Of course, existing loans um, are uh, more standardized than the restructuring loans or loans gone bad. So we see higher variability in the productivity. But the, uh, the punchline is that these, the question and answer exchange motivating uh, the, sh the information sharing resulted in a huge productivity gain for the bank, and the gains are, in fact, highly statistically significant. So uh, I'll just pause there and point out that a typical IT department may have experience with systems integration, software make versus buy, ERP systems, CRM, and outsourcing. Most organizations have little idea at all how to apply some of these principles um, to knowledge management as a whole, and actually grow the entire ecosystem. Some of the ideas from these are uh, seeding and subsidizing the marketplaces, creating a market to facilitate exchange and matching people, matching experts to, to problems, um, and managing the money supply for optimal growth, using fiscal and monetary stimulus to see if you can actually grow the economy and run campaigns in order that you can actually get better behavior out of your ecosystem as a whole. So with that,
we are exactly at um, one o'clock your time. I'm happy to pause for questions. Um, uh, and any of you can actually try to reach out to me at, at these locations. Um, or if there's still you know, still time, I can actually go into about 10 minutes, 15 minutes worth of the bottom line for the information productivity study where we actually uh, observed all the information flows of the uh, consultants and actually correlated that with the dollar measures of their productivity uh, in another empirical project. So let me just stop there and take any questions and see uh, what folks are most interested in hearing about. Marshall, this is Denise. Um, please take any additional time um, to talk about the flows. Uh, if you hear silence from us, I think it's because many of the people who are on the call right now mm -hmm. are just thinking about how we can bring this into the creation of what we were calling a Knowledge Sciences Center, which would be designed to help places like Ohio or Baltimore uh, transition more into a knowledge economy and better understand what we meant by that. So I think we're a little bit overwhelmed right now with ideas. So. Well, well this is, uh, creating knowledge economies is exactly what the set of tools are designed to do. Another example is um, speaking with the World Bank. And yep. they have this uh, wonderful set of projects of trying to disseminate knowledge across the globe. And you can imagine someone had solved the microfinance problem in Chile and you'd like to share that knowledge with Zimbabwe. But they have, it's, it's exactly like that ACOM problem earlier. They have no idea who's got, the person with the problem has no idea who the expert is and how would you actually locate them um, or motivate them to share that information. Um, so we've been talking with the World Bank about possibly trying to set up similar systems to this to, um, you know, to get those, uh, to get people to share and reward and propagate uh, valuable information across the globe. Excellent. I was, my next question was going to be, have you, have you spoken with Klaus Chilm at the World Bank about this? And I suspect that that's who you're working with or someone from finance and private sector. He had spoken with a couple of other folks, but had not spoken with Klaus. So any introduction to would be would be very welcome. I will, if you don't mind, I will send the link to. I will send you the link to this webinar, but I'm also going to send it to Klaus and his team because that organizational network analysis that was done in IFC mm -hmm. that, yeah. that was um, Klaus's urging. Yes. Oh, outstanding. That would be very interesting. Yeah, I'd be very I'd be very eager to follow up with that. Thank you. Oh, and I think John Lewis has some um uh, has a question. John, I'm gonna unmute you. Yes, hi, uh, Marshall. Very good. I uh, really enjoyed this presentation. Actually this week we were talking about the exact word you used there, which was matchmaking. And uh really enjoyed uh, connecting the dots on matchmaking between uh, people that sort of have a question, people have an answer, taking that to another level of people that are answering, but those answers are, are used going forward in the derivations, and then matchmaking from the standpoint of rewards and turning into real value. That was a uh, great um, a building of those ideas. The one idea you, you went over a, a little too quickly for me, which was interesting, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about was people trying to cheat the system, what that's like and how you detect it and work work around that. Wow, great question. Actually, we have a whole presentation on that one topic alone. Um, let me give you, uh, give you an example of what happened earlier and then how it was detected and then trying to give you some of the, the, the broader properties for it. So uh, what happened was that folks tried to at, ask some silly questions like, uh, where's parking? Uh, or what's the weather forecast for tomorrow, which were really kind of two-bit questions, but they were offering, uh, you know, 500 or 1,000 points for that to do money laundering to their friend, and then the, the friend would ask the same question in reverse and money launder it back, so it looked like they were generating lots of value. You can imagine that what happened was that people that got jumped in the points earning immediately said, well, how did they do that? They just beat me by 500 points. Um, and so they immediately went to go check out what happened and all of the transactions are public so that the people that got um, uh, jumped in the queue were immediately motivated to report it. Um, what we did is to develop effectively a peer adjudication system. So you can, these markets become self-healing by allowing tr information transparency across all the transactions so other people can see it. Uh, and, and ferret out problems. 
Uh, and then you can also turn it back to the market using peer adjudication. In some ways, I, I casually call it crowdsourcing Judge Judy uh, as a nice way of actually um, uh, handling it. But it, it, you can actually build this directly into the market so that it's self healing really nice property is that unlike most of your fraud detection systems, so at banks, for example, they have very sophisticated fraud detection systems for money laundering and stolen credit cards. But what's interesting is that people will try to invent new ways, and so the existing algorithms can't detect new forms of fraud. Well, crowdsourcing can. So you can use this as a complement to other forms of uh, fraud detection. So you can match this with uh, existing algorithms and then reward people for finding uh, for finding problems. So that becomes again part of the ecosystem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, as a quick uh, follow up, uh, I, I'm starting to think about uh, the way you explained that, and I'm wondering if um, if it's possible for some uh, false positives in that detection of of cheating that someone may think that. Um, you know, even in a patent process, there's parts in, uh, of the process where someone thinks they have an original idea and you post it. Um, you find out someone else has already done that. There's there's uh, there's a period of time where someone might call that uh, looking at you submitting something as an original idea when it's already out there as plagiarism. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, how I'm just kind of exploring down this path. I think that understanding this part of the process is going to be key to uh, making this work. You're, again, that's a very nice question. That's exactly the set of issues that you want to look at. We'll look at the false balancing, the costs and benefits of false positives and false negatives. So that's exactly what you want to do. So there are a variety of ways to, to handle that. Again, we have a, a kind of a whole presentation on the topic. The specifics of that are um, the, the first order mechanism when the systems are small. Uh, you can usually just turn that back to a system administrator. Unfortunately, that has bottlenecking problems, so really what you want to do is to get it to scale. Again, so if you use peer adjudication, uh, almost like a jury system, uh, you can actually handle those false positives and false negatives in a way that scales very elegantly. You can also look for more than one accusation uh, and accumulate them uh, after, after something has been flagged. In some sense, it's rather like the um, report this uh, question or record this image uh, that you get on a lot of the existing crowdsourcing things today, but most of those are settled by the platform itself. The more sophisticated mechanism makes this scale by uh, turning it back to the crowd and on peer adjudication. Okay. Uh, any other questions? It, I. I'm not seeing any further questions right now, Marshall, but if you have time and you'd like to go into that, the uh, flows, we'd be very happy to see that. Sure. Well, I'll spend a couple minutes on that one then. So here's, here's just a little bit more on the uh, information, tech, information flows and the relationship to productivity. So here's just a, a basic question. Does information flow make people more productive? Um, and in this case, uh, what we did is we studied the knowledge workers in several consulting firms were able to measure, uh, were able to instrument their email servers, in fact, literally every single message down to the word level of all these consultants. Uh, if any of you are interested, we actually even invented a technology which allowed, which gave them privacy, even though we were allowed to, uh, to analyze the content down to the word level. But we couldn't read a single message. It's really interesting how we did that, I can tell you. Um, we were able to measure the productivity based on the dollars of each consulting project. So you know exactly when a consulting project starts, you know exactly when it stops, you know the hours they worked on it, and you know uh, how many dollars they brought to it. So we could then run statistical regressions of their information flows against their actual measures of productivity. What we see here are um, populations, this is just a subset of six weeks of email of a, a couple blocks of consultants. Uh, and you can actually see thicker flows representing more communication patterns. Uh, the dark blue nodes are one group, the yellow nodes are a different group, and the green nodes are a different group still, and you can actually see who's communicating with whom. What we found is that both the structure and the flow did make a difference. As an example, 
that node has a very high index of betweenness. That's W14. That betweenness measures the frequency with which any given node appears on the shortest path between other nodes. So that has a higher rate of information flow. Um, so that, one, that one's strongly associated with higher rates of productivity. Uh, in addition, the, the constraint matters. That's the extent to which the neighbors of uh, a con given contact talk amongst themselves, or do those neighbors talk to other neighbors? To the extent that they do, you have more variety, and that too is associated with greater rates of productivity. So here are a couple of things that we that we found. Uh, we've put up, you know, by the way, 52 question surveys that looked at personal characteristics, time use, where are they getting the most value, uh, their information sources, their work habits, their information sharing habits, with whom, why, the perception. Um, we managed to get uh, an 86% percent, percent, um, response rate. The rates are unusually high, uh, and the rate, the reason is basically used economics. We bribed them. Uh, if you fill out a completed survey, then you got $25 in Amazon gift certificate. So despite the fact we've had lots and lots of different people involved, we've got very, very high uh, response rates. Um, we also then give them feedback on whether or not their responses were resembled that of a senior partner, whether or not the responses resembled that of a really high-powered um, rainmaker, or whether or not they were answering more like a staffer um, that didn't have much influence. So you could actually give them these really interesting feedback um, uh, information feedback that each tailor got individually. Um, and this also motivated them to share information because they could see their own behavior and their managers didn't get to see it. So it really was a way to, um, uh, to, to, to again, get that response rate very high. Here are a nice illustration of differences in work habits. The four boxes represent four different individuals. The horizontal axis represents 24 hours in a day. The vertical axis, uh, axis represents the number or volume of emails sent um, within that hour. But what's interesting is in the different work styles. In the bottom left, you see a senior partner who works a very steady day. He's in by 10 o'clock, works throughout the day, leaves at 6. The top left is a junior partner, a sort of junior consultant, who's just working their asses off. Uh, you can see, they again, this is average over six weeks, but you can send they send their first uh, email somewhere around 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can see a dinner break somewhere around 6, and then you can see the total exhaustion somewhere around midnight. Uh, so you can see a really different pattern. Uh, if you look at the bottom right, you can see someone who sends the first email at 7 in the morning. They take a break, grab a shower and a breakfast. They show up at the office at 10. Uh, they work until 3 when they have lunch, and then they work at midnight. Different patterns are very indicative of very different work productivity. Uh, also, at different levels of status. Uh, one thing we found is that batching your email, for example, actually tends to make folks more productive than answering it continuously because you have large blocks of time uh, to help you to make productive, make you productive. Here uh, is a different view. In this case, each vertical bar represents a single person. The bar uh, above represents the volume of email sent. The bar below represents the volume of email received. And again, you get very different characteristic patterns based on whom uh, you're looking at. If you look at the second person to the left, C12, there's a very lo uh, long bar extending down below. That's a real rainmaker. This is someone who's receiving lots of external email. Notice the darker red or purple is external email and the Taylor, lighter blue, is internal email. This person is a rainmaker who is receiving lots of external email. Uh, on four from the right is an older staff member uh, who really needs to be targeted for some training. They're not using the technology very much, so they could be much more productive if they use the technology uh, much more. Uh, toward the middle uh, is one uh, C23, the high vertical bar sent. Uh, not much received. You, you might characterize that as noisome med. Every organization has one. Uh, they send a lot of information and no one responds. They're really just uh, sending out too much. So again, you, you get to see very different uh, patterns of behavior and different patterns associated with productivity. For reference, the statistics show really the following. One, if you want yourself to be, if you yourself want to be productive, you should either be a hub or connect to hubs. In the context of consulting, each additional social network contact was worth $6,000 per year. 
They literally, people with more contacts generated more money. It was quite substantial. Second point is communication style matters. Send short, focused messages. This is highly statistically significant. If you send the message on the left, folks get back to you. If you send the message on the right, they may not get, they, they may get rid of the, mark, the email completely. If they get back to you, they'll tend to park it. Um, the person on the right sent an email message and the request for information is in the fourth paragraph. That means that it's often delayed or not answered at all. That reduces your own productivity if you needed an answer on a question or if you needed some uh, task to be performed. So sending messages on the left versus sending those on the right makes you more productive. The other interesting thing is to seek diversity. If you look at the flow, um, we actually traced when new phrases or ideas entered the organization. I'll, I'll report, repeat that again. Each node in there is one person. You can see where that idea diffused. So you see the next three people get it, then the next person, the next person. It turns out um, the diffusion rates and where information enters really matters. Word level diversity in the organization. So if you see news that I didn't see, it's worth about $70 per word per year. It's really quite remarkable. Also, if you are earlier in the rank, if you, are, if you receive news ahead of other people, that's worth about $5,900 per uh, rank order. So being sooner, uh, again, the time, it really is a, a specific measure of how much value you get by having information earlier uh, than other people. So that's just a quick summary, again, a nutshell of uh, that research. There are about three or four separate papers on that. Most of those are technical. Uh, but all of them are up on SSRN in case you actually happen to be interested in them. Well, Michael and Marshall, thank you so much. Um, this is amazing. Um, our, my students have to read your papers, so and they enjoy your papers. So um, we'll be I'll be going back to SSRN for some additional. But gosh, I don't know. Just uh, just saying thank you. That, that last bit, there were so many ideas in there. Um, we do a lot of semantic analysis um, of, of information at Kent, and I think you've given me a whole bunch of new ideas. John, do you have any other comments or questions? Uh, no, that was that was fantastic. I, I don't have that paper. I was wondering how I get a copy of it. Marshall, I'm going to make an, a virtual introduction for you to Klaus Tilms. Um, do you also, have you ever worked with Nicole Fernandez at Georgetown University? She she teaches at Georgetown and Kent, she teaches our organizational network analysis course. Really? Oh. I, I will introduce you there. The other person I'd like to, with your permission, um, share this um, webinar with is Brian Hackett, who is the leader of the Knowledge Leaders Forum, which is a private group, but it's like the Fortune 100 companies in KM. Oh, Most fabulous. of them I think you know, but I will do that introduction anyway. Fabulous. Yeah, I'd be very happy to, uh, I'd be delighted to work with all of them. Thank you so much. This is amazing. And well, it's my pleasure. I hope, I hope it's valuable. And if anyone has any interest or, or curiosity in following up, uh, please do. Uh, almost all the papers are available up on SSRN.com. Uh, some of I, I grant some of them are highly technical. So we wrote the slow management review to try to summarize uh, some of those results. But it, they you know, they're they're based on rigorous academic research and statistics and economic theory. And we see if we hope we can actually help organizations and individuals become more effective. Yes, Marshall. This is Michael, uh, and uh, that the uh, just talking about the the second part of the presentation you gave. That's the um, this is the second or third time that I've encountered you know this research, um, and there's always something new that I find interesting in it. Um, one thing I was interested in is um, a lot of your research is about sort of the non-rivalrous nature of information and how the uh, benefits multiply as it's shared. Do you find any incentives for hoarding? in the, the study of email in terms of the hoarding information? Um, and were there different views of that from different ranks within the consultancy? It's a great question. Um, if you're interested in that one, actually you might enjoy a really short three-page Harvard Business Review article on uh, how to create colleagues rather than creating competitors. Um, 
give you a couple of different ideas on that. Um, one, it's very tied to the incentive system. Um, but two, uh, the, the, one of the biggest reasons folks don't share is actually opportunity cost. Usually it's the case that they may not put their information into a system or go online just because they don't have time or the rewards aren't big enough. Usually just they're so busy doing their, you know, doing their own work and helping other people do their work, um, you know, may not, may not make it to the top of the queue. The way this interacts with the incentive system is really to look at whether or not your incentives are absolute or relative. In absolute incentive, you reward someone for just getting past the threshold. So, for example, in a classroom analogy, anyone that gets above a 90 gets the A, and it doesn't matter if the whole class gets above the 90 or if only, you know, one or two people get above the 90. In a relative incentive system, it's yardstick competition, and you might say only the top 10% are going to get the A, no matter what the score. So even if the top score is 40, only the top is going to get it. The competitive system shuts information sharing down. Um, that's the relative reward. The absolute reward, where you know, anyone gets above the, uh, the, uh, the cutoff, then everyone gets the reward. So in that case, if you share your ideas and I share my ideas, we can both be better off and we can both get ahead. The difficulty with, well, that seems like the best solution, um, the trade-off is that that can also lead to coasting. There will be free riders in there that want to accumulate the knowledge of others and not contribute their own. So there's a really interesting trade-off between designing your incentive systems between um, you know, relative and absolute incentive system to get it right, to get the optimal levels of information sharing together with the optimal levels of effort. So there's a very short article uh, in Harvard Business Review on uh, create colleagues not competitive uh, on how to do that. Uh, excellent. I will, I will look that up. And it seems to um, tie in with just the general view of open source um, software as well. Like it seems like you would have the same issue as um, you know, there's there's there is value in in crowdsourcing and, and getting um, a diverse set of skills and improving your software. But then you know you have the free rider and coasting issue as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't. Are there any any further questions? I think I think um, we're still thinking about this. <laughs> We'll probably have questions next week. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank well, you so much. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and happy to follow up anytime. Hope things, uh, hope things are great on your end. Thank you very Thanks much. very much, Marshall. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Denise. I will send mm -hmm. you an email later. All right, great. All right, bye bye.